Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, for a time when I was in college, my parents lived on a small lake in Orlando, Florida. And at some point during that time, my dad got a hold of a small sailboat, maybe a 12-footer, and taught himself how to sail on that lake. I think he uh, loved to sail back and forth across the lake, and he imagined himself to be some sort of Captain Ahab on the high seas looking for the white whale. I knew nothing about sailing, but one summer when I was home from school, I met a young lady uh, and decided I wanted to impress her by taking her for a small sailboat ride on our lake. So I asked my dad to teach me the basics. You know, how do I do it? I mean, how hard could it really be if my dad could do it? So he took me out on the lake, showed me how the boat works, how the rudder worked, and how the, uh, the keel worked, how the sail worked, how uh, you could catch wind going any direction. Um, and he made, made sure he emphasized the keel part because he said if the keel's not down, from the middle of the boat, uh, the rudder won't work at all, you can't steer the boat. So I said, yeah, 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 I mean, how hard could it be? So a couple days later, I picked up my date, and we jumped in the sailboat, and I took her out for what I hoped would be an exciting cruise on the lake with me as the swashbuckling captain. Well, just a few minutes into the ride, the wind was perfect, the sails filled up, and we kind of shot out into the water. But within a few minutes, I realized that as I was trying to, you know, turn the boat a bit, um, it wouldn't turn. It wouldn't respond to the rudder. And it, the wind just kept blowing us. And it was a strong wind. It kept blowing us straight across the lake. I couldn't move it any, in either way. Uh, to couldn't turn either direction. And it, we were headed straight for the other side of the lake where there was this tall stand of reeds. Um, and we eventually blew straight into those reeds. I had to jump out of the, of the boat, chest deep in the, in the water to keep it from turning over, from capsizing. And by this time, you know, I'm pretty embarrassed. I mean, it, it, it didn't, wasn't, didn't go like I thought. And I was kind of mad, too, because my dad sent me out on a, on a faulty boat. The boat didn't work. Uh, something was broken on his boat. So I grabbed the rope at the front of the boat and had to walk that boat around the entire perimeter of the lake hundreds of yards to get back to the little patch of beach that was at our house. And by the time I got there, I was steamed. And uh, I, I, I saw my dad standing on the beach w watching us uh, with a, kind of a stupid grin on his face. And so I said, your boat doesn't work. He looked at me with kind of a smile and he said, you, did you remember to put the keel down? And I said, keel? And he said, yeah, remember I told you that if you don't put the keel down, the, ro the rudder won't work at all and you can't steer the boat. So I dragged the boat up on the beach and I never sailed it again, and I can remember. I also never saw that particular young lady again. And to this day, my dad teases me about the day I took the sailboat for a walk. Now, we're in a series today from the Gospel of Mark. We're continuing on. The series is called Following the King. And last week, we looked at the story, a well-known story, called The Feeding of the 5,000, how Jesus calls us to bring to him whatever it is that we have, and then he multiplies that gift for his kingdom purposes. Now, today, we look at a story that takes place on a lake, and in a boat. We're in Mark chapter 6. I'm going to read uh, beginning in verse 45. You can follow along on the screen here as I do. Mark writes, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. Now I want to show you a map of ancient Israel here. Uh, you can see Jerusalem here to the south uh, and you have here the, the Dead Sea or called the Salt Sea and then you see uh, the Sea of Galilee up here to the north, and they're connected by the Jordan River here. Um, and if we zoom in now on the Sea of Galilee, uh, we can see, and by the way, the Sea of Galilee was roughly um, 13 miles long by 8 miles wide, roughly some, somewhere around 8 times the size of Lake Geneva in Wisconsin. But here we can see Capernaum to the northwest. That was the home base of Jesus and the disciples. We see um, the, 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 the realm of uh, Gennesaret, which was over here, where he had, he, where he had uh, cast the demons out of the man and, and sent them into the pigs. Here we see Bethsaida, where they're headed. And the story we're reading today takes place right about here, right in the northern spot, middle of the Sea of Galilee. Verse 46 then says, After he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. 
And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, and by the way, the fourth watch of the night was the last watch in the way they thought of time, between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. He came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, and cried out for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Now, I think there are three parts to this story. And I'm going to begin with what I'm calling the king who sends us. The king who sends us. Uh, part of my uh, regular exercise routine these days is riding my bike. Now, I used to have, in my younger days, a really cool bike, a Trek road bike that had the, the low handlebars, that had a, a really super thin tires and uh, 18 speeds and a little computer on the handlebars that tracked my velocity and my average speed, all that sort of stuff. But now I have what I call my old man's bike with traditional handlebars up high, so I have to lean over to hold on to them with only three speeds, you know, slow slower and really slow, fat tires, a big wide seat. It's much easier to ride, it just doesn't go quite as fast. But I like to ride in the bike trail that's a pretty narrow home in Batavia, it runs from Batavia all the way down to North Aurora, and it's a beautiful place to ride. So a couple Saturdays ago, I jumped on the bike, went out for my morning ride a bit earlier than usual. I wanted to get it all done and have the rest of the day. It was a beautiful fall morning and I was feeling pretty good. So I started out and what I noticed is I turned on the trail which is about a mile or so from our house, uh, that I was just really, really feeling good. I was, I was, I was going, uh, I was seeming to be riding faster than usual, and I was just moving along cruising. I was passing people, uh, which doesn't usually happen, uh, and I was just going. I thought to myself, you know, I've been doing a lot of riding lately, and I think it's finally starting to really pay off. I'm getting in shape. I'm getting stronger. I'm, I'm just killing this ride. And I finally got to my turnaround point, which is six or seven miles down, uh, in North Aurora, I turned around and headed back, and I discovered why the ride had been so easy. You guessed it, the wind had been at my back. I just couldn't really tell. So the seven miles home was a greater struggle. I mean, I had, I had to use the lowest gear. Uh, people started passing me left and right. I mean, people walking dogs were passing me. Well, not, not actually that slow, but I just dragged myself home, got home fine, but it just wasn't much fun. Look at Mark uh, 6, 45. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. He saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. So the miracle of the feeding of, of the 5,000, probably 10,000 or more total, uh, has just happened. He sends the disciples by boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, uh, some maybe three or four miles at that part of the lake, uh, while he stays behind. Now, why would he do this? Why would he send them out, and why would he stay behind? Well, I think there are two main reasons. Mark tells us first that Jesus went up onto the mountain to pray. Now, this was his personal practice. As we read the Gospels, he often went alone uh, to places to pray by himself to his Father. We don't know here what he's praying about. Mark doesn't tell us. <clears throat> Maybe he was thanking the Father for the, the great gift of the miracle of, of, the, of the feeding. Maybe he was uh, praying for his disciples who he just, he, he just sent out uh, onto, the, onto the lake and the boat. But he goes off to pray, and he goes off alone. Secondly, notice Mark says he made them get into the boat. Now, the sense of the word here um, is, is urgency. There's an imperative here. He compelled them. He insisted that he get into the boat and cross the lake without him. In other words, he sends them intentionally into the wind. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why? Why does he do this? Now, we've learned so far in the Gospel of Mark that everything Jesus does is intentional. Everything he does is designed to teach his disciples and, I think, to teach us something about himself, something about his kingdom as we walk following him in his kingdom. I think he sends them into the wind to teach them something significant. I mean, they've seen him cast out demons. They've seen him heal the sick. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him provide a miraculous amount of food for an amazing amount of people. They've come to believe he's the Messiah, the king. 
But to this point, it would be easy for them to assume that he had come to make life easier for them. That he'd come to eliminate all pain and suffering and even physical hunger. Because that's what they've seen him do. So he knew that they did not yet fully understand either who he was or what he had come to do. Or even what life in his kingdom was going to be all about. So here he makes them get into the boat. He sends them uh, into the lake against the wind without him. So what is it that he's teaching them? I think he's teaching them that life in the kingdom of God, life in the kingdom Jesus came to inaugurate, life following him is not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be easy. Now think about it. Here the disciples obey Jesus. They do exactly what he tells them to do. They get in the boat. They head to Bethsaida without him. And still they find themselves in a very difficult, Mark says even painful situation. They're rowing against the wind, making headway painfully. The word used here actually is very strong. It's the word used to describe torment or even torture. They're straining at the oars to the point of utter exhaustion. I think Jesus might be teaching them here and us that even in obedience, we will face headwinds. Even in obedient faith, we'll face pain and struggle. Even in obedience, we'll come to the end of our resources and our strength. Now, that wind might be personal pain, personal illness, maybe loss. That wind might be a global pandemic called COVID. That wind might be political or cultural turmoil. In fact, I believe that if we are following Jesus, if we are citizens of his kingdom, we are almost always going to be sailing against the wind of our culture. And if we read the New Testament carefully, I think, and if we look at Christian history, Jesus has always sent his followers into the wind, in a way. Early on, the wind was called the Roman Empire that sought to destroy this young movement of Christ's followers. The winds of war and plague and political persecution followed them throughout the centuries. Uh, The winds of the 17th century enlightenment, when men rejected God and uh, and rejected God as the source of all truth and instead worshiped instead at the altar of secularism. When all that began some 300 years ago, it continues now and the wind still blows today. I think, for example, of the current cultural gospel, which is no gospel at all, that the self is the source of all truth now. That's what we hear. Be your truth. Speak your truth. The widespread rejection of the biblical teaching about the sanctity of human life, for example, or about the holiness of marriage, or about the reality of personal sin. All these under attack, even now, in our culture. The winds are blowing. And Jesus still sends his followers into that wind. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, Jesus himself says, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus knew that the winds would blow. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul explains to the church why he reminds them so often of the central truths of the gospel. He writes, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. The Apostle Paul knew in the very first century that the winds of culture would blow strong. Here's the truth. We today are no longer living in a Christian culture. That is, if we ever were. We are no longer even living in a post-Christian culture. I believe we can make an argument that we are now living in an increasingly anti-Christian culture. The wind is blowing, and the wind is strong. The second thing I see in this passage is uh, the king who sees us. We have the king who sends us, and now the king who sees us. Uh, Several years ago now, a man made an appointment to see me. 
uh, in my office, and I had a pretty good sense of what he was going to talk about because I knew a little bit about his uh, family situation. Uh, he had a 20-something-year-old son who was struggling with mental health, uh, with something that is called uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, the young man had recently had a really serious and frightening episode where uh, he had disappeared for several weeks. Uh, his mother and father had no idea where he was, why he had left, even if he was alive or dead. He eventually turned up. The police found him over a thousand miles away from home in another state, and he wound up in a psychiatric hospital there. I couldn't imagine the stress and pain on those parents, but he, and that's what I thought this man would probably want to talk about. But he walked into my office, and he was carrying his Bible in his hand. He shut the door. He got to the front of my desk, and he just threw his Bible on my desk like that, and he said, I'm done. And the voice, uh, his words were flat, and like all the faith and hope had just drained out of him. He said, I'm done. So I got him to sit down, and he went on to say basically that if this is what faith got him, if this is what all the prayers for his son had got him, if this was all that God could do, is leaving his son lying in a ditch on the side of a road a thousand miles from home, then he said, if that's it, then I'm done. He said, I'm done with faith, I'm done with prayer, I'm done with God, I'm done with the church. And he said it about just like that. And my heart just broke for him. It just broke for him. I'm going to come back to that story a little bit later. Verse 47. And when evening came, and the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land, and he saw, I want you to see that word, that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. I want you to see that too. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So it's two in the morning. It's dark and it's windy. The disciples have been rowing against the wind for hours now, making excruciatingly little progress, and Jesus is nowhere to be seen. Here's what I see at this moment. There will be times when it seems like Jesus is far, far away. Even when we're trying our best to follow him, even when we're obeying him, there'll be times when it seems that God is not watching, not listening to our prayers, not paying attention, that he doesn't care. That's why that father threw his Bible on my desk so long ago. But notice, Mark says, Jesus saw them. He saw that the wind was against them. He saw that they were struggling and in pain. Here's a question. It was the fourth watch of the night, Mark tells us, between 3 and 6 a.m. in the morning. It's dark. That boat is at least two miles out onto the lake. The wind is blowing and the waves are, are churning. How does Jesus see them? How does he see them? He can't possibly see them with his physical eyes. It's dark. It's the middle of the night. He must be seeing in a different way. Let me show you Psalm 139 and how it speaks of God's different way of seeing. The psalmist writes, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to the heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, the depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell on the uttermost parts of the sea... Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the, light about, uh, be, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. You see it? It may seem dark to us. It's not dark to him. We may feel like we're lost, hopeless, but he sees and knows exactly where we are. I think Jesus is teaching these disciples that they are never out of his sight. Even in the dark, even when the wind is against them, even in their pain and struggle, he sees them. Here's what I think he's saying today. You are never out of his sight. I am never out of his sight. When we feel that he's far away, and we do sometimes, when we feel like he's not paying attention, and that's what it feels sometimes, we are to trust our faith more than our feelings. 
We are trust to trust what he tells us more than what we feel. And then we see Jesus comes to them. Mark writes, and about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. So Jesus comes walking to them on the water, and the first reaction is fear. They're scared to death. Why? Well, they think it's a ghost. And why wouldn't they think that? A phantom of some kind. I mean, what else? Who else can walk on water? They weren't expecting Jesus. After all, he was far, far away in their minds. But again, Jesus is telling them something about himself. If we look at Job chapter 9, the ancient part of the Bible, Job, speaking about God, says, He shakes the earth from its place and makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heaven and then this, and treads on the waves of the sea. By walking on the water, Jesus is telling them something about himself, about who he is, and that he can come to them even when they think they are alone, in the dark. He can come to them at the time of their greatest need. And then Mark says this interesting phrase, and he meant to pass by them. And I read that the first time, and it, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense. Why would he do that? Why would he come all this way, <coughs> excuse me, walking on the water and just to walk right by them? But that's... Not what Mark's saying if we look carefully. Mark here is using some Old Testament language to reveal who Jesus is. Way back in the book of Exodus, in the Old Testament, Moses is desperate, and he begs God, Yahweh, Jehovah, to show himself to him. We read in Exodus 33, Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he, God, said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and proclaim before you my name, the Lord. But he said, you cannot see my face for man should not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you will see my back, but my face shall not be seen. In 1 Kings, when the prophet Elijah is fleeing for his life and desperate, God says to him, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Do you see it? So when Mark says Jesus meant to pass by them, he's saying Jesus intends to reveal himself to them. Jesus intends to show them his glory. And then Jesus says something else. Look at verse 50. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. The exact phrase there in Greek is ego eimi. Translated here, it's it is I. But if you translate it literally, it is I am. In other words, take heart. Don't be afraid. I am. Now, this should make us gasp if we understand what's going on. This should make us tremble in awe because when Moses asked God for his name, way back in the Old Testament, this is what God said. He said, I am that I am, Yahweh, Jehovah. I am is God's personal name. It's how God describes himself. So Jesus is saying here that the God who created everything that is from nothing, that the God who set the stars into place, who set the seas into place, the God who gave us the breath of life, the God who made a covenant with his people, the God who delivered Israel from the land of Egypt, that great I am is now walking on the water in the middle of the storm, and he's come to them. So Jesus passes by and reveals to them his glory, his presence, and then his identity, I am. So they will have confidence in the midst of the storm. The point here is not that Jesus will rescue them from the storm, although in a moment he does just that. The point is the I am is with them in the storm. And then the third thing we see in the story is the king who saves us. The king who saves us. Verse 51. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. 
Now, if, you've re if you're reading through your journal of the Gospel of Mark, uh, as we go through this series, you probably noticed that this is the second storm on the lake story we see in Mark. Uh, you may have noticed that the first storm story occurs in Mark chapter 4, and we did not preach on that one in our series, but you may have read it. And in that story, the disciples are with Jesus in the boat, and they run into a storm on the sea. And Jesus is sleeping, you remember? Uh, the storm comes up, it's serious, they're about to capsize, taken on water. So they wake him up in a panic and they say, how can you be sleeping? Don't you care that we're going to drown? And Jesus just says, where is your faith? And then he commands the storm to be still, and the disciples are in awe, and they react with a question. They say, who is it, who is this, who even the winds and the sea obey him? That's in the first story, Mark 4. Here in Mark 6, the second story, the story we look at today, Jesus actually answers that question. Who is this that even the winds and the sea obey? He says, the answer is, ego eimi, I am. And then he gets into the boat with them. Mark tells us immediately the wind ceased and the disciples are astounded, amazed. Why? Because he walked on water, because he said, I am, because the wind ceased. And notice, in this occasion, Jesus doesn't say anything to the wind. He doesn't have to command it. His presence is enough. If you're a parent, you may have a story like this, but when one of our boys is very young, he didn't like to go into dark, uninhabited parts of our home um, by himself. So if he had, in the evening, he had to run upstairs to his room to get something, uh, he'd go to the stairs, he'd look up into the dark upstairs, and he'd look back at me and he'd say, I'm scary, Daddy, I'm scary. And I would just walk over to him and walk up with him, and my presence was enough to allow him to walk up into the part of the house that he feared, calmed his fears. Do you see, do you know that Jesus sees you? That's what the story tells us. Do you know that he comes to you? Do you know that he's in the boat with you? But even after all this, look what Mark writes. And they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, which happened the previous day, but their hearts were hardened. Now, if you're with me in this, that's kind of a weird end to the story. Mark is sort of abrupt when he tells these stories. But when he says their hearts were hardened, he doesn't mean they don't believe Jesus. He doesn't mean they are sort of somehow against Jesus in some way. He just means they don't fully understand what it all means. They don't fully understand who Jesus is and what he came to do. He's going to save them. He's going to save the world from the world's sins but he's not going to do it in the way they assume. Let's go back for a moment to that father who tossed his Bible on my desk so long ago. As that story went on, <clears throat> that his son came home, uh, entered into a, a rigorous treatment process. Eventually, after a significant time in that treatment and much, much prayer by his mother and many, many other people in church, uh, he experienced near, nearly total deliverance from those symptoms and eventually got a job. Uh, a couple of years later, he got married, and that painful and frightening season in their lives came to a joyful and redemptive ending. But the point is that Jesus was in that family's boat all the way along. That father just didn't see. He didn't understand. The wind was strong. The circumstances seemed very dark. But Jesus saw them, and he came into their storm, and he showed them his glory. Now, I don't know where you might be today as you watch this. I don't know what kind of headwind you are facing. I don't know how strong it is. I don't know how tired and exhausted you might be today. But I do know this. Jesus sees you. Jesus sees you. He knows how tired and how exhausted you might feel. He knows exactly the headwinds you are facing. And he comes to you. And he is with you. Jesus is the king who calms your storm. And he is the king who wants to save you. Would you bow your head with me as I close in prayer? Lord God, we thank you today for your word for this ancient story that reminds us that no matter how strong the wind is against us, 
no matter how dark our current circumstances might seem to us, no matter how far away you might feel to us, you see. You see us, and you come to us, and you are with us in our struggle. Lord, I'm sure there's someone watching this today who is finding that the wind is really strong, who's at the end of their strength and maybe feels lost and alone. I pray you would remind them today through this story in your word that you do see them, and that by your Holy Spirit you come to them to give them strength and hope and peace. And through the assurance of your presence and by the promise of your salvation, I ask you to calm their storm and calm their heart today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Wow, what I took away from that message uh, that was so important to hear is that if you want to be in a part of God's kingdom does not mean things are always going to be easy though that's what, of course, we want, and that's even sometimes what we expect. But Jesus never promised that. What he does promise and what we can stand on is that Christ sees us, is that our king is in the boat with us when we are facing life's headwinds. Now, I wonder what each of us, what each of you are thinking, uh, what you're feeling is your headwind right now whether it's a headwind that you're facing this week, this month, or even this year. Let's rest in that truth. Regardless of what you're facing, whatever you're, you're, the storm you're in, let's rest in that truth that Jesus sees you and that he's with you in the boat as you face this storm, that he'll face it with you. Let's rest in that this week. Bless you, church. Hope you have a great week.